Hey guys, welcome back to the Lou Perez Podcast. My name is Lou Perez. If you want to support the podcast, please head over and join my Locals community on Locals.com. Locals.com. And I'm really excited uh, for my next guest. Um, her name is Nadine Strassen. She's Professor Emerita uh, of Law at the New York Law School. Uh, she's the former president of the ACLU, and she's the author of a great book called Hate, um, which she's holding up right now. For those of you who can't see it, go head over to Amazon or any of the bookstores that, if there are still bookstores around, and ask for some hate. Um, you might get you might you might get some weird looks, but it is uh, it is not a book promoting hate. It is a book promoting ways to fight hate by uh, instead of having hate speech laws, uh, having more and more uh, free speech. So, Nadine, thank you so much for uh, for joining me today. Oh, Lou, thank you for hosting me. Yeah. So um, uh, it seems like when it comes to free speech issues, uh, no matter how much time goes by, we're constantly busy needing to explain just how important free speech is every generation to generation. Um, how did you uh, get involved um, you know, with the ACLU and in particular with free speech uh, causes? I became involved with free speech causes, Lou, long before I heard of the ACLU. I think pretty much as soon as I could raise my voice and people started trying to censor me, namely my parents and my teachers. <laughs> I, I'm very serious. I mean, I was constantly punished in school for uh, talking in class when I wasn't supposed to be. And so to make a long story short, when I discovered that there is a First Amendment free speech guarantee, and there is an organization, the ACLU, that uh, seeks to get government to respect it. It was a, a match made in heaven, so to speak. And uh, when you first uh, joined the ACLU, what were some of the uh, big cases that, uh, that came up? Well, shortly after I graduated from law school was when the ACLU was embroiled in the historic so-called Skokie case, which to this day, many people see as the most famous or infamous case the ACLU has ever handled. And I think really epitomizes what free speech is all about. The ACLU, which has staunchly for more than 100 years now, defended human rights, including for people who have traditionally been discriminated against racial and religious minorities, as well as free speech, came to the defense of the free speech rights of uh, an organization which was expressing ideas completely antithetical to our own civil libertarian views, namely a group of neo-Nazis who, to add insult to injury, wanted to demonstrate in Skokie, Illinois, a town that had not only a large Jewish population, but at the time, this was in the late 1970s, many of them were Holocaust survivors. So uh, very very painful and upsetting speech, but the ACLU honored that famous statement attributed to Voltaire. We know he didn't really say it, but he could have, uh, which is, I may loathe what you say, but I defend to the death your right to say it. And even at the time, uh, I say even at the time because we're having these debates again right mm -hmm. now, uh, but they've been recurrent throughout my adult lifetime. Skokie was certainly a time when even ACLU members, uh, many, uh, many ACLU members thought that we had gone too far in defending free speech and the ACLU lost 15% of our members resigned in protest. So you think, you know, these are the most diehard free speech supporters, those who fork out their $20 to become a card carrying ACLU member. If defending free speech for hateful speech is too much, even for them, it really underscores how unpopular that is with um, a, a large segment of the public. But Lou, even though it was a losing case in the court of public opinion, I really want to emphasize that it was a winning case, a slam dunk winner in the courts of law because the principle of freedom, even for the thought that we hate, has been called by the Supreme Court of the United States unanimously the bedrock principle of our free speech jurisprudence that government may never suppress speech solely because its ideas, its message, its viewpoint are hated, even if they're deeply reviled by the vast majority 
of the public. That is never a justification for censorship. Instead, we have to answer back. We have to counter demonstrate, counter protest, educate, uh, use our free speech and other methods other than censorship to counter the hateful ideas. Yeah. And, and you talk about, you know, the uh, the pushback and, and just how uh, the case, you know, lost in the eye, in the eyes of, of, of public opinion. There's a, a a new documentary that came out not too long ago um, uh, called "The Mighty Ira," uh, and it's produced uh, and directed by my good friend uh, Nico Perino, and it's my about uh, yeah, and it's about Ira Glasser, um, and a, a huge part of the documentary uh, involves that time in Skokie and just what they, they were dealing with. And uh, I know uh, Ira uh, being Jewish yourself. I, I thought it was a terrific film. I was interviewed for and I'm happy to say I have, I have a bit part in, in the film talking about the Skokie case. Yes, my father was imprisoned in the Buchenwald concentration camp. He was born in Germany in 1922 as what the Nuremberg laws, you know, those odious racial laws classified him as a Jew of the second degree because one of his parents was Jewish. He was also very active in the anti-Hitler political movement. So for both of those reasons, he was thrown into the Buchenwald forced labor camp and he was literally scheduled to be sterilized because the Nazis had a program of um, eugenics, eugenicide, in addition to direct genocide. And one day before his appointment to be sterilized, Buchenwald was liberated by the American military. Mm. Uh, so I always like to thank them when I speak to military audiences. I owe my, my life as well as my liberty to, uh, to the U.S. military. So I app could not loathe the Nazis more. Many other extended members of, of my father's family were slaughtered, as were, you know, my husband is also the um, son of Holocaust survivors. If I believed that censorship would have prevented the Nazis rise to power or the Holocaust, I would have been in favor of it. I mean, no free speech absolutist, which means very strong defender, absolutely unqualifiedly without exception defends free speech. We simply say that those who want to suppress it have a very heavy burden of proof. They have to show that the suppression is necessary in order to promote some countervailing goal of great importance. And if, if I were convinced that suppressing speech would have been uh, even effective, let alone necessary, to prevent the Nazis from coming to power, I, I would have been in favor of censorship. But the historic record shows exactly the opposite. Uh, Nazis and other hate mongers were subject to very tough anti-hate speech laws in the Weimar Republic uh, during which Hitler rose to power. They were prosecuted, they were convicted, they served time. And obviously that didn't stop their rise to power. Conversely, these trials became propaganda platforms for them where they gained attention and sympathy that they otherwise would never have received. And uh, on, a, on, a, on a personal level, so uh, in the documentary, and for those of you who haven't seen it, you know, please go, go check it out. Uh, Ira has this um, contentious relationship with a survivor of the Holocaust who lives in Skokie, who this is a man who lost, I think, everyone in his family and managed to squeak by and survive. Inc just an incredible, harrowing story. And Ira has to explain to this man why he is defending the right of people who would uh, happily, you know, uh, reignite the ovens, you know, and, and destroy, the, you know, uh, more Jewish people. He has to explain to him why he's holding uh, to this to this principle. And did you did you ever have to do that with your own family, with your own father? Were those arguments there? Uh, yes, I. Uh, but I would say for my father and my, I still have some surviving 
relatives in Germany. Um, it's more a general skepticism about the importance of free speech than uh, not, none of them has contended that uh, censorship would have been effective in preventing the Nazis uh, from coming to power. And I, I think what's also interesting is if you look at Germany today, it continues to have extremely strict anti-censorship or anti-hate speech laws, and yet anti-Semitic violence and violence against refugees and, um, and, and immigrants is extremely high in Germany. There's at least as much a more serious problem than there is in the United States. So uh, those hate speech laws clearly are not doing the job to to prevent the problems. Yeah, it's it's really wild when you look at Europe. Um, you know, they're supposed to, I think a lot of times people look to Europe as if they are, you know, better than us, than us, you know, us backwards uh, Yanks and sort of uh, uh, the wackos that I consider myself an American wacko. But um, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, but when you look over there and you start looking at the population of, of Jewish people, you know, even in even in a country like France, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, Jewish people just fleeing. Um, right, they're very, they're very afraid. I mean, let me let me say something that your uh, audience members may not be aware of, which is so shocking. A couple of years ago, 2018 to be precise, uh, the uh, the uh, 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 Chancellor Angela Merkel in Germany appointed for the first time ever in German history a cabinet level official in charge of uh, anti-Semitism or combating anti-Semitism. This is a country that has had those problems in the past, but that the problems had gotten so severe. Uh, and, and, and that person in 2019 issued a warning to Jews in Germany that it's not safe to wear the yarmulke, uh, the skull cap that many observant male Jews feel a religious duty to wear. It's not safe to wear it everywhere in public in Germany. And that was echoed by the head of the umbrella organization uh, of all Jewish uh, organizations in Germany echoed that because people have been beaten up even in Berlin uh, and subjected to anti-Semitic epithets uh, when they identify as Jewish. So, you know, that that's happening in the 21st century yeah. in, in Germany. Uh, it certainly shows that, you know, maybe things would be even worse if there weren't anti-hate speech laws. Mm -hmm. But I think it's we've got to focus on dealing with the underlying attitudes and the actions. Germany only shockingly recently made it illegal to actually discriminate on the basis of race, religion, and so forth. You know, while the United States lags behind, I would say ahead of the rest of the world in refusing to censor hate speech, we were pioneers. I mean, it was too late, but we were ahead of the rest of the world in outlawing discrimination in employment, housing, public accommodations, and so forth, and also punishing discriminatory violence. That was the problem in Germany, that Hitler and his thugs got away with assaulting and even murdering Jews, my other minorities, and their political opponents. Are, are you familiar that there's something that happened recently? Um, uh, there's a show called The, uh, the Mandalorian, which I guess is a, a Disney show and an actress on it was recently uh, fired. Um, she won't be brought back to the series. And I guess one of the reasons why they, what they cited was um, posts that she had put on uh, on social media, on, on Twitter. And uh, the actress, her name is Gina Carano, who mm -hmm. I think she started out as a, uh, uh, as a mixed martial artist. At least that, that's how I, I know her. I, I still haven't watched the show. I hear good things about the show, but I haven't, I haven't watched it. Um, and apparently one of the posts that she put, um, was basically saying, uh, and I hope that I'm, that I'm, you know, doing it justice. Um, in Germany, uh, they made it uh, so that uh, your neighbors would uh, go after you if you were Jewish. It wasn't that it started. Uh, it wasn't like just at the top right, right. right from the beginning. It was your neighbors would uh, beat you, would steal from you, would would do things like that. And she likened it uh, to being a uh, I don't know if it's a Republican or a conservative in the mm -hmm. United States now. So she made that, um, you know, that historical, uh, you know, illusion, you know, uh, she brought the two, the, the two together and people were saying that, well, that's anti-Semitic and that's, you know, she needs to, she needs to go. Um, and, 
you know, I, I, I look at it and I say like, well, you know, it, it's apt to argue that she's wrong, that it's, mm -hmm. that it's not the same, but the idea that um, the best course of action would be just to get rid of this, <laughs> rid of this person. You know? and, and if it's something that you're not familiar with, I don't want to, you know, go. Yeah, I'm not familiar with it. that incident, but the, you're raising a very important principle, um, be, which is that uh, precisely those groups who have been subject to discrimination and, and discriminatory violence, including Jews, should be the last ones to advocate censorship because in the long run, we absolutely depend more than other people and other groups on robust free speech. Members of minority groups, by definition, are never going to wield majority political power. So uh, we depend more than others on free speech, free freedom of assembly, being able to raise our voices, advocate, lobby, petition, organize. And yeah. uh, that's why um, my book has a quote I love from Noam Chomsky, who speaks against hate speech laws, including hall anti laws that make it a crime to um, to question the Holocaust, uh, Holocaust denial laws, which exist in Germany and throughout Europe and many other countries. He said, it, it seems to me to be the greatest disservice to the memory of those who perished in the Holocaust uh, to adopt a tactic of those who murdered them yeah and and there, there's something too to be said about uh i think i i, I don't get offended very often when, when i uh especially when i when i see things online i'm more offended by by actions than mm -hmm. than words um but there's something about you know uh hyperbole is is the norm oftentimes anytime we're talking about politics and, and that sort of thing mm -hmm. and uh one of the i remember not too long ago, you know, uh, uh, the president being, you know, compared to Hitler and his mm -hmm. and Trump and Trumpers being called Nazis. And mm -hmm. um, they're often my, called fascists. Right? Yeah, fascists and, and migrant children being uh, compared to, you know, Anne Frank. And mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's one of these things where, uh, you know, I, I I wouldn't go into, you know, making those, you know, hyperbolic, uh, you know, connections or, or anything. But but the idea that I just don't think we're going to hold uh, everybody to the same standard, which I think is 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 really tough. And uh, I think you know, should we have gone, should we go down the route of having hate speech laws? I'm very doubtful everyone would be held to the same standards, even in a court of law. Yeah, and, you know, it, it's so interesting because. If we had those laws, then I can't think of a politician that would not be subject to um, indictment under them because everybody, even the most loving, gracious person, uh, such as Barack Obama, has said uh, some things that could well be considered to be to be hateful. He may, and I, for Barack Obama, who truly is somebody I revere, despite having um, disagreed with a number of his policies. But the only example I can think of, uh, but it is serious, is remember when he made that derisive comment about uh, people who um, have to cling to guns and God, mm -hmm. right? I think, you know, I have no doubt that somebody would consider that to be hate right. speech under any of these laws. And Hillary Clinton, the basket of deplorables, uh, the same thing. And yeah, I, I believe me, I have to say, <laughs> don't take this out of context. I don't think it's hate speech. I don't think it right. should be punished, but it would be jeopardized. It could be, uh, you know, whoever is wielding political power could use it to go after uh, political opponents. Yeah, and, and it could be seen too, I think, as using a, the bully pulpit as well. I, I remember um, a couple of years ago, I uh, did a show and one of my guests was uh, uh, this man Barry McDonald, who's, who's also a professor of law, he's at uh, he's at Pepperdine, and he was bringing up these examples of things that were happening around the world, where uh, countries and in particular in, in Africa, uh, like state officials were, I think it was state officials or it was at least state sanctioned. They were going on the radio and calling their enemies vermin. They were yes, calling this them. Was in Rwanda. This what was it? Was Rwanda and doing that? And you're talking about, um, you know, these are people. In, in control, mm -hmm. you know, with that power, then mm -hmm. calling these people, uh, you know, vermin and mm -hmm. basically saying how they should be treated. And I think you're right. I think a, a case could easily be made where it's like, well, wait a minute, we're talking about someone who might be the future president of the United States calling people deplorables, mm -hmm. um, you know, lower than, um, than, than, uh, 
But that's because, the, and as the Supreme Court has said, every time it's had a case that does involve political hyperbole, it's always defended free speech, saying mm -hmm. if you're going to have, you know, vigorous debate in in the, in that context, as you started this line of conversation, uh, Lou, people tend to exaggerate, yeah. and you use it's it's a rhetorical strategy that mm -hmm. nobody takes. I mean, no thinking person should take literally. Uh, maybe we can talk about uh, incitement. Um, and I, I was just going to say, because when you get beyond rhetorical, hyperbolic statements and there is a statement that directly causes certain harm, then it, it's in a different category and it can and should be punished. Yeah. Do you uh, do you think uh, what uh, President Trump said, I guess, the morning of January 6, 2021, before the um, uh, the storming of, of the Capitol um, does that rise to the level of, of incitement? It would not, in my opinion, it would not rise to the level of criminally punishable incitement mm -hmm. under the First Amendment. But that is not the issue that's before the Senate. The standard right. for impeachment is, is, is different, and it could well rise to that level in that context, uh, especially because he has a uh, responsibility, he had a responsibility as the President of the United States to quell potential violence, not to, to stimulate it. Uh, the test that we've had in the United States since a unanimous Supreme Court decision in 1969 from an ACLU case, I'm proud to say, Brandenburg versus Ohio, only allows punishment of intentional incitement of imminent violence or lawlessness where the violence or lawlessness is likely to happen imminently. Uh, Trump faced a charge of incitement arising out of his uh, one of his campaign rallies when he was running for president the first time around. And I think that's quite an analogous situation. There were uh, some demonstrate counter demonstrators and Trump urged his supporters to remove the counter demonstrators uh, from the, the rally. He used some uh, instigating language, uh, but in and, and the counter demonstrators were roughed up. They were assaulted in the process of being removed. And uh, interestingly enough, the lower court judge said, well, there's enough factual material here that, you know, it could go either way. But on appeal, the appellate court stressed the fact that despite some incendiary language, Trump also said, but don't hurt them. And mm -hmm. so that court concluded that uh, overall, his statement could not be punishable as incitement. And I think the same facts obtain, quite similar facts obtain from his January 6th remarks, right? Um, he had allusions to peacefulness. And uh, so I, I don't think he could be criminally punished, but I certainly do think it is an impeachable offense. Yeah. And I, and I wonder, uh, you know, uh, shortly after that, uh, he was thrown, he was kicked off of uh, Twitter, um, mm -hmm. suspended, like his account suspended uh, forever. So there's no way that, that he'll get, get back there. And uh, one of the, uh, one of the reasons given was, was the incitement uh, charge. And I wonder, you know, if, if, if there were to be say a separate trial where uh, uh, Trump was, you know, charged with incitement and he ended up, um, you know, uh, being found not guilty because um, he hires you as his uh, as his lawyer to to defend him, um, you know. I would Twitter, you know, have to accept him back. No, yeah. no. Twitter as a, a private sector sure. actor, not a government uh, entity, is not bound by the First Amendment at all. Twitter could ha kick anybody off or refuse to have anybody on for any reason or for no reason. It just the way you don't have to host me uh, or anybody else on your podcast, right? That's you are exercising your First Amendment rights in making those decisions. And that's what Twitter is doing. And I don't think that it's trying. These social media co uh, content moderation policies are deliberately 
um, not allowing speech that the government would have to allow. In other right. words, their restrictions go far beyond what the government could constitutionally impose. And that's very worrisome because for all practical purposes, when you're talking about the giant platforms, um, that's where really where the action is. If you're going to reach an audience and uh, as a politician or somebody who's interested in public affairs, um, you really need those platforms and yet you don't have any First Amendment protections against their censorship. Yeah. Not to mention no due process protections, no equal protection uh, protections either. Yeah, and, and you know, it'd be, uh, I found it interesting that sort of the same people that were, you know, condemning uh, social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter for helping Donald Trump get elected in 2016 mm -hmm. uh, were then cheering them on for finally getting rid of them. And it, it's one of these things where, you know, I, I, I totally get the, the argument. It's a, it's a private uh, company. They can, they can do what they want. Mm -hmm. But for the court of public opinion to treat them uh, like they're these, you know, uh, benign agents or, or, you know, or worse, you know, doing good. Um, it's just, it's tough. It's tough to swallow. It's sort of like, you know, they have, they have other intentions for sure. Right. And, and even though I defend their first amendment rights to, um, exercise their editorial discretion, I really uh, am a very strong critic of how they are doing it. And among other things, Lou, they are being so subject to pressure by government officials and politicians who are basically saying, you better voluntarily uh, restrict more speech or we're going to regulate you. And I think actually very serious arguments are starting to be made now that maybe this should be seen as government censorship, that government is exerting so much pressure on the social media companies that it is in effect using them to carry out its own sensorial programs. I mean, the amount of times, you know, we hear government officials talking about Twitter, talking about Facebook, bringing them up in, in conversation. Uh, it's just so it, it's so weird where now the you know those platforms are being used as sort of a um, political tool, you know, to uh, you know, well, let's let's get all the conservatives pissed off at you know so and so, and then and now let's get everybody on the left pissed off at at, at so and so. I don't know how, I don't know what happens moving forward. I don't know what it looks like. Well, there's no doubt going to be a serious effort at regulation. Biden, uh, had, when he was running for, for president, uh, said that we should get rid of so-called Section 230, which, uh, as people probably know now, is the liability shield that um, platforms have for content that's posted by third parties. I think that would be disastrous, but I think there's a serious, uh, there's going to be a serious effort to do it. The reason it would be disastrous is that would increase uh, censorship pressures on these companies, right? They wouldn't, uh, if they're facing potential liability for what the rest of us post, uh, they're probably going to return to the very stringent kind of gatekeeping role that we saw in traditional media newspapers, uh, broadcast TV and, and, and radio, and that would completely destroy the unique benefit of the internet as giving every one of us an opportunity to communicate with, with the rest of the world. So I'm very, very troubled about that. Um, uh, also coming down the pike, there are there are antitrust investigations. I think that's very serious. I, I don't know whether um, the remedies are warranted, but certainly the the extreme uh, the extreme power that's wielded by some companies um, is, is very troublesome when they're not accountable to uh, the Constitution. They're not accountable to democratic processes. Uh, for all of the dangers that that Trump and and Biden, uh, because both of them have policies that are um, against free speech on some important issues, for all the dangers they pose, I think that the titans of Silicon Valley are even more dangerous because um, they are not subject to constitutional constraints. We can't vote them out of office. We can't impeach them. Um, so it, we have to find some other ways to to restrain that power from and from being abused. Yeah, well, I guess that I mean, that that's a really important question. And a, I think a difficult one is like, how do you uh, restrain that? Because, uh, 
you know, uh, you were talking about getting rid of, you know, Section 230, which I think is something that most people uh, don't really understand. Um, Including uh, those who want to get rid of it. <laughs> exactly. And, and I wonder, you know, at what point does a, um, a government body regulating something uh, like is there is there a point where they can regulate it so much where they where the company has to abide by you know constitutional protections like meaning I, I don't know how I you what you're saying you know what I mean how do you maybe you could explain it better so, yeah uh, well there yeah. are there are so many different strategies that are being talked about Lou I would say even in the last um, couple of the last couple of weeks um, in the in the aftermath of both January 6th and Trump being kicked off platforms, there's just been an explosion of uh, theories that are being voiced even by libertarian uh, professors and economists who are uh, suddenly coming up with all kinds of theories as to why the, and how these private sector companies could be regulated. Uh, for example, a very prominent libertarian law professor who spent most of his career at the University of Chicago, now he's at uh, New York University, Is that Epstein? Richard Epstein, Richard Epstein. Um, was interviewed in the Wall Street Journal a few weeks ago. And I was really surprised that he, of all people, uh, was advocating that the giant social media companies uh, could and should be treated as regulated public utilities or common carriers, harking back to an old common law concept that when a private company is such an essential part of the infrastructure of everyday life, you know, when it started under common law, it was the innkeepers, right? Um, that they could, had to treat everybody in a fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory way. Well, that makes a lot of sense, and it seems to me to be uh, very worth exploring, treating at least the very, very large companies as analogous to the landline phone companies a century ago, and just the way we don't allow the phone companies to uh, kick us off for, you know, to, to monitor what we're saying and to kick us off if they don't like what we're saying. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, force to, to, to that analogy, but it's, it's a complicated and delicate, and I think we would have to proceed very slowly before taking such a major step to make sure there aren't unintended adverse consequences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a, a guest on, a, a friend of mine, he's also a comedian named Ryan Long, and something that he brought up was uh, how when Trump was kicked off um, Twitter, he was quickly kicked off Facebook, and then a lot of prominent uh, Trump supporters, they saw themselves kicked off. Then the um, platform Parler mm -hmm. was taken, I think, out of uh, the App Store. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've, I've heard so much about uh, people having you know, bank accounts or credit cards closed down. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and yeah, when you start, and Ryan was bringing this up to point to, you know, this, this obvious collusion happening here, where mm -hmm. it's like, you know, what all these different platforms seem to be talking to one another and saying, mm -hmm. okay, okay, today's the day we can get rid of, uh, we can get rid of so and so. That's, that's a really scary position to be in, even even for you know a, a you know hardcore you know libertarian like myself. Mm -hmm. The idea that 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 somebody's livelihood could be taken away exactly. so quickly is it. Yeah, it's it's exactly. a struggle. Yeah. Exactly, and that's why I'm coming around to that position as well. Uh, there are other um, technical solutions that uh, I think would be important. When I say solutions. Um, what I see as the problem is too much restriction of speech. I have mm -hmm. to acknowledge the fact that the vast majority of critics of social media come from exactly the opposite perspective, right? They're constantly saying, oh, there's not enough restriction. You're letting up too many hate mongers. You're keeping up too much disinformation, right? Uh, so we have to acknowledge that there's going to be a lot of pressure for reform to move in exactly the opposite direction. But if we wanted reform that was going to empower our individual users to express ourselves and to choose to receive the content that we choose to receive. That would be my ideal. And that was the initial vision of, of the internet. Um, then some technological solutions that have been advocated by uh, groups such as the Electronic Frontier Foundation are usually called 
interoperability, big word, and delegability that these platforms would have to be open to uh, intermediaries put, plugging in their own content moderation alternatives. So each of us could choose. We mm -hmm. wouldn't be beholden only to the standard issue that, as you say, is becoming standardized across all the companies. But we could have, you know, the Lou Perez free speech channel, and we could have uh, the opposite and, and, and everything in between. Delegability means that for those of us who are not technologically adept, we could delegate that function to some expert companies or individuals who would take care of it for us. Yeah, I, uh, I've i been, I guess, living online for, for a long time. I've been, man, for you know, well over 10 years, I've been putting stuff on on YouTube and uh, and all the other platforms. And the one thing that I just consistently wish for, I'm just like, look, just just let me block people who I don't want to deal with. And then just let anybody who wants to see my stuff, see my stuff. I, I don't think I'm asking for uh, asking for that much. Um, and I think most people would be, you know, would be OK with that. Um, uh, you I, know I, what really scares me, Lou, and I, I'm really surprised it has gotten very little attention compared to the degree of the problem, is um, you and I are using Zoom now. Right. When I teach, I use Zoom. The vast majority of my constant speaking engagements, webinars, podcasts, so forth, are via Zoom. There are a few competitors, but Zoom is really dominant. Uh, and Zoom, under its contract and terms of service, retains absolutely no obligation obligation to host uh, any content at all. So we've had a number of incidents. The first one that got publicity was back in September, uh, where Zoom got wind of a forum that was going to take place at a university in California. Um, it had some objection to uh, one of the speakers, and it canceled the forum at the last minute. Then to make it even worse, a couple other universities, including NYU, were hosting Zoom events to protest the Zoom censorship. And guess what? Zoom blocked those as well. Uh, and I think this, I mean, when you, it, so all of the universities in the country that are dependent on Zoom and, and are committed to protect academic freedom and free speech are beholden to this company that does not share their commitment to academic freedom and free speech. Wow. Well, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know about that this whole time. I've been, I, I have yeah, a I said, subscription. It's been, it's been really under publicized. Yeah. For the Zoom uh, gods watching me, come on, guys. Uh, what are you? What are you doing? Um, uh, for, fortunately, I'm, pretty, I, 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 I'm sure the other companies have similar similar um, uh, policies. So I didn't mean to, but Zoom is so dominant; it's well, particularly concerning. Well, and it's 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 one of those things where, you know, I feel like I'm. Uh, I don't know. I feel like I'm a throwback to a different to a different era where, the stuff that will get you you know, kicked off or have, have somebody, you know, have a company like Zoom not run your, your seminar is stuff where I'm like, really, is this really what we're doing? I, I've been, uh, uh, I've been having a, a lot of fun going on YouTube and watching old clips of Firing Line with William oh, F. Buckley. I used and, to do that show. You, you were on it? Oh, yeah. Quite oh, a wow. Yeah. Oh, oh, man, I got up. Yeah, I, I'm gonna have to, to binge um, uh, some some episodes with you on. And you know, there are episodes there where you have William F. Buckley, uh, you know, debating um, uh, Chomsky. You have him talking with members of the Black Panthers. Mm -hmm. there, there was one uh, in particular uh, he was talking to. I don't know if he was a mayoral candidate for Philadelphia, a black man. And behind him were standing two uh, guys in, in fatigues, his bodyguards with their arms folded. Mm -hmm. Like, this is wild stuff. And what, you know, you don't have to like William F. Buckley to say, hey, you know what, I want to I want to hear what this conservative, uh, how he's going to respond to, you know, people on the far left. I want to hear what he has to say with mm -hmm. when uh, when not Gore Vidal, like, I, I know he's not friends with Gore, Gore Vidal, but like when he has Norman Mailer on and, mm -hmm. and all this. And uh, I don't know, maybe I'm longing for the days when that was just normal, when I was mm -hmm. just, hey, mm -hmm. this is what this is what we're this is the way we do things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
when uh, when you were on what what did uh, did you talk about uh, oh I, I was on multiple times for various civil liberties issues the ones that and and some where he and i agreed he and i also were on the campus lecture circuit together we debated each other many times on campuses all over the country i remember on on gun rights, on abortion, affirmative action. Uh, but there were some issues where we strongly agreed, namely um, uh, drug policy. And he came around. Yeah, a lot of yeah, people don't yeah, know that. Yeah, a whole yeah. National Review when he was editor um, was on board for de decriminalization long before any liberals uh, did so. Mm -hmm. Right. The liberals were so afraid of uh, being accused of being soft on drugs or soft on crime that it was the conservatives who, who were in the vanguard and civil libertarians on that right. issue. Yeah. And um, uh, well, it, it, I know that that you wrote a book uh, defending uh, pornography. I, I haven't I haven't read it. Uh, read the book yet. Uh, are there any pictures? Yeah, I was just going to say, <laughs> the pictures are actually quite amazing because I, if I do say so, I chose them to illustrate that no matter who you are, there will be something, some image that is deeply important and valuable to you that other people will denounce as pornography, mm -hmm. including some uh, pictures of uh, illustrating biblical scenes. So mm -hmm. for those who are coming from a Christian traditionalist uh, anti-pornography perspective, they would be horrified to know, but there actually have been attacks on biblical imagery and 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 language as being pornographic. And and certainly from the, the so-called radical feminists who wanted to censor pornography, a lot of their own words and books were attacked as being pornography, right? Because in the, oh, the, the, my fav favorite uh, illustration of that, Lou, there was this organization in New York called Women Against Pornography. And they used to have these sidewalk displays in prominent places, including Grand Central Station, wherever there was a lot of foot traffic, where they would display blown up images of what they considered to be the most horrific, violent, misogynistic, disgusting pornography, right? And they weren't displaying it because they thought people would look at it and commit mm. crimes or rapes against women, right? They thought it would have the opposite impact, which just shows the lack of logic in, in, in the censorship. Um, position, but uh, they were actually thrown out of Grand Central Station by commuters who complained. And guess what? They came to the New York Civil Liberties Union asking us to, to defend them. their right to display pornography. Wow, wow, that that's really interesting. I, I uh, it, there was a, there was a debate going on on Twitter. I guess you know not too long ago. The, the, these culture war debates pop up every now and then and you're like what what year are we in but uh, i guess a number of conservatives were talking about um i think i think they said uh we should we should take pornographers out and shoot them in public or something like that it was some it was some you know crazy thing and i i responded to one by saying you know if you film that would that be considered a snuff film and would that be you know pr protected but you know obviously people get um you know they have you know, very strong reactions uh, to, to pornography, and it, it's and uh, you know recently uh, Larry Flint, uh, I think just the other day passed away, yeah, and yeah, yeah, yesterday, and I uh, yesterday I I tweeted out saying that uh, Larry Flint and Two Live Crew, which is a, a rap group, did more for free speech than than the New York Times, and I might be I might be hyperbolic there, but but the two of them definitely did. Uh, um, did uh, great things for, for free speech. And, and not just sexual expression, which is important, but he was a uh, crusader for free speech, for you know the right to burn the flag, the right to engage in political satire. He had a case that went all the way to the Supreme Court that was extremely important about you know the right to satirize public officials and um, the idea that emotional distress is not a justification for censorship. Extremely important. The film that was made about him uh, is really excellent, and I think it's terrible that it was boycotted. And I think it was um, boycotted from getting Academy Awards. Oh, really? Uh, because I, I may be wrong about that. There was a campaign to try to do that, spearheaded by Gloria Steinem and other anti-pornography feminists. Um, it's really too bad because the film was so much about 
the other, you know, I, and I defend the, his right to, you know, create pornography and other people's right to, to use it. But his legacy goes far beyond that. He was a crusader for uh, civil rights, you know, for racial justice. And in fact, it was somebody who disagreed with that aspect of his work who, uh, who shot him. He spent, mm -hmm. you know, the last part of his life, many decades in, in a wheelchair because of his civil rights activism. Yeah. And then what, what are the arguments now for people who are against pornography as far as uh, making it making it illegal? Um, because uh, I know the, the arguments uh, for obscenity often come down to, you know, what your community would would uh, would think of, of pornography. But now with with the Internet, I mean, the whole globe is local. So yeah. I don't know how you would, you know, use that argument. Well, first of all, these are technical terms okay. and I don't I don't think it's necessary to get into it. They're they're terms that apply to different categories of sexually oriented expression. Um, obscenity is the only one that has legal significance. It's a small subset of sexually oriented expression that the Supreme Court has said should not be protected in a very controversial decision. Mm -hmm. So feminists who wanted to outlaw, some feminists who wanted to outlaw a different category of sexual expression. Obscenity is based on offense to traditional community values, right? Okay in the local community. And uh, Andrea Dworkin and Catherine McKinnon, starting in the late 1970s, spearheaded a crusade that said, no, we're concerned about sexually oriented expression that demeans or degrades women, and therefore we contend leads to discrimination and violence against women. I'm part of a number of feminist groups who feels exactly the opposite, that uh, it is women and um, lesbians and uh, advocates of reproductive freedom who depend on robust free speech, who are going to have our speech outlawed and demonized as, porn as pornography. Uh, as demeaning to women, and, and, and therefore we have the biggest stake in opposing those laws. And in fact, um, a feminist style anti-pornography law was passed in Canada. And just as we had predicted, uh, among the first works censored were books written by Andrea Dworkin herself. Because why? In, in crusading against pornography, she describes it. And so her books mm -hmm. were, were confiscated by Canadian customs as pornographic. And um, all the lesbian and uh, bookstores in Canada were essentially shut down because the law enforcers said that's inherently degrading and dehumanizing to women, even if it's consensual. You know, that makes it even more degrading and dehumanizing. So I take the same position on sexual speech as I do on so-called hateful speech, Lou, that it is up to each of us as individuals to decide what we do want to see and what we don't want to see. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the government should have no business censoring it based on content alone. It's only if in a particular context it poses an immediate danger of specific serious harm, such as the intentional incitement that we talked about earlier. Only in those contexts should speech be uh, suppressed. Well, one of my, my first jobs after I graduated college undergrad um, is I wrote erotic fiction for a living. So it was like a full-time job writing erotic fiction. And I didn't work there too long. I think I maybe, maybe three months at the, at the most, but, you know, just imagine your, you know, your day, you, you go, you know, you take the train, you, you go, you go to an office building in lower Manhattan, you sit, you sit in a cubicle and you write smut, you know, and, and some of it is stuff that you just come up with, or some of it is uh, old stories that you just, you know, change things around in order to, to re-release re re them. And uh, we had a, a real readership. Like this was back, I think, before you know, porn was just so uh, accessible online. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the, th the one of the top, I think, genres that we had was was incest pornography. Mm -hmm. Now, all these stories that these are all the written word. I'm not you know, mm -hmm. making videos or anything like that. Um, but, you know, here I was like a 23 year old, 24 year old kid writing like <laughs> writing incest stories. And they're basically the same stories, except you just, you know, use mom instead of 
Deborah <laughs> or, or whatever. It, it's really that like, you know, and then, you know, there'll be like a, like a, a, a double entendre or something like that. Um, but what I, what I learned was uh, in Canada, they don't allow you to, they don't, it's illegal to export incest stories to Canada. Um, and I don't know if that means that, you know, their incest stories are literally homegrown there and they do it. Um, I never, I never got that deep into it, but it was such a, it was such a weird world of, you know, at the border, these, you know, these books are not allowed to, you know, to cross the Canadian border. And it's funny that you use the word erotica, right? Because that yeah. has a positive connotation. Right. Pornography has a very negative connotation, mm -hmm. doesn't it? But they literally mean the same thing. And in fact, even the most rabid anti-pornography feminists um, said, well, you know, we're not outlawing all sexual we don't want to outlaw all sexual expression we think erotica is fine and somebody asked one of them it may have even been gloria steinem well how do you distinguish between pornography and and erotica and and the answer was uh what turns me on is erotica mm -hmm. what turns you on is pornography <laughs> yeah uh this stuff that i wrote was garbage oh god it was so <laughs> it was it was really really off I, I still have um the books the digest uh, mm -hmm. if you will um that uh, maybe at, at some point uh, i'll talk <laughs> i'll talk more <laughs> about it um be, before we go um I, I would love to talk about a uh, a pet peeve that it, it looks like both you and i have and that's regarding the uh the often touted line of about shouting fire in a in a theater or shouting fire in a crowded theater and how the first amendment doesn't protect your right to shout fire in a crowded theater. Uh, could you, can you talk, can you uh, explain where that comes from? And sure, I, I'd love to hear your pet peeve take on it. I assume we have the same reasons for it. It comes from a famous dissenting opinion by uh, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, which very strongly protected free speech, except in, in you know pretty much the, the point that I've been summarizing because it's now become the law uh, for many, many years, many, many decades in, in the United States. That is that only when speech posts poses an immediate great danger, is government justified in censoring it? Uh, and so to illustrate that, Holmes used this theater metaphor. Now, 99 times out of 100, people will purport to paraphrase it by saying, you don't have the right to shout fire in a crowded theater. But they leave out the crucial word falsely you don't have the right mm -hmm. to falsely <laughs> shout fire in a crowded theater if the theater is on fire you want people to shout it please and, that, <laughs> that be, and, and the point is lou obviously in that context it you know if it's true then it is life saving it's positive the speech is positive it's only if it is false and life endangering um that you were justified in censoring and for what it's worth he also didn't use the word crowded right, right. <laughs> so any theater yeah so nowadays with uh, i guess you know covid and social distancing you can't find a crowded <laughs> theater uh anyway my my pet peeve with it is the, is the is that nobody seems to know about the case uh that yeah. you know that actually resulted in, in that quote and uh it's uh, I I never forget I remember how Is to it pronounce Shank? it. I think it's Shank. Sh Sh yeah, Shank. Sh yeah, so Shank. I apologize because that was he was that was still a majority opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He only came around to dissenting in a later case. Yeah. Yeah. So Shank versus versus the United States. Um, you had uh, a, a group of uh, members of the Socialist Party who were giving out pamphlets, telling uh, Americans, American men, uh, not to submit to the draft because. Uh, your value as a human being is 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 worth more than than cannon fire. So you should not submit to the draft. And they were they were thrown in jail under I guess the Espionage Act of of 1917. And it's sort of like every single time somebody brings up, well, you're not allowed to shout fire in a crowded theater. It's like you're using the reasoning of a case that would put every anti-war activist in prison. Anybody who you know, who uh, any uh, pacifist in prison, and so I really wish I, 
I wish people would, uh, you know, uh, and that's no longer a really, use that. That's a really good point that, you know, and, and thank you. I'm going to add that to my litany of complaints about <laughs> this statement, uh, misuse of this quotation. Yeah. yeah. Um, anything uh, exciting coming down the road uh, for you in, you know, life oh, or free speech? I'm, or I'm constantly doing debates. And I think the most interesting one that was added recently, you know, this program IQ squared. Oh, yeah. 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 So I'm going to do a debate for them next week nice. on um, um, arguing that the social media companies were wrong to deplatform Trump. Whoa. I always take these really popular positions. Well, yeah, it'd be, I mean, it must be fun for you. You know, it must be so much fun being, well, well because you are, you know, constantly, uh, you know, you're constantly on the, the forefront, on the, the vanguard and the zeitgeist, even if you're, even if you're protecting uh, protections that should be there, it's, you still, I, you, I don't know, you still feel like radical in a, in a sense. Well, there's, there's nothing more satisfying than being an activist, having an opportunity to try to influence values and, and, and realities that you think are important, right? You're doing that uh, as well with your free speech, Lou, right? It's, it's yeah, I hope satisfying. <laughs> Sometimes it's frustrating, but it's a lot yeah. better than the alternative remaining yeah. silent. Let me know how I'm doing, guys, please. Um, I could uh, I could use the support. Um, well, Nadine, thank you so much for uh, spending some time with me. And um, I'm so happy we were able to to reschedule. And uh, yeah, hopefully uh, when it when is the IQ squared? Uh, do you know? What I think it's on the 19th. 19th. Very cool. Is it going to be live? Uh, I have can... no idea. I yeah. will be happy to send you the information they sent me. Right on. Cool. Yeah. And it, right. I think if it is live, you know, they always take votes. So please vote. No. Regardless. Vote, vote, for, right. <laughs> <laughs> vote even if you can't watch it. Right, right, right.